Greetings from Frontier Nursing University. I'm Dr. Susan Stone, the president of Frontier Nursing University. And today I plan to give you an overview of the events and the happenings of 2020 here at our university. Each year we review the previous year and we provide an update on how the university performed at all levels. As all of you know, 2020 was an incredibly difficult and trying year for a number of reasons. From the pandemic to social inequity and injustice to the most political year in recent memory, 2020 threw a lot at us. We all faced our own individual challenges, successes, victories, gains, and losses. And through it all, life continued. And now we are well into 2021. And what we are seeing is the signs that this is going to be a much better year. That said, I am very proud of how Frontier Nursing University navigated the past year. We were not perfect. We had our ups and downs. We identified ways in which we can improve, but we also revealed the many reasons to be proud of how we re responded to the challenges of 2020. Over the years, we have developed excellent virtual teaching and learning strategies that allowed us to serve students across the country. And when COVID hit in March, those strategies were put to the test and we passed with flying colors. While working from home and virtual classes have been a part of the way that we work for the past 30 years, the frontier bound orientation sessions and the clinical bound sessions have always been on campus events. In March of 2020, Many of our students were quite suddenly shut out of their clinical sites. We needed a system that would allow new students to, new students to attend frontier bound and in a virtual way, and also for clinical bound students to do clinical bound in a virtual way. And we were hoping to figure out a way that we could allow them to do at least some of their clinical hours using virtual simulation. Further, the DMP students needed a way to continue their DMP projects, even though they could not go into their clinical sites. Our faculty went right to work developing virtual bound sessions and an innovative way of allowing the DMP students to continue their projects virtually. They also developed a unique simulation course that allowed students to attain at least some of their clinical hours, even though they were not in their sites. It was absolutely amazing that within two weeks, the sessions were in place with very little interruption for our students. The efficiency and thoroughness of this work was reflected in the feedback from our students who themselves accepted the sudden change in plans with both patience and enthusiasm. I'm gonna show you now some of the data about these changes. So this is some of our outcomes. So our virtual bounce uh, sessions began in March. In the first term of 2020, we were all still on our Haydn campus. So that, as I said, the virtual bounce uh, started in March. Overall, we held 12 virtual frontier bounds. We held about five DMP bounds. We had three crossing the bridge virtual sessions, and we had 17 virtual sessions for clinical bound. Uh, overall, the total number of students you can see there, 742 frontier bound students, 261 DMP bound students, 465 students attended clinical bound virtually, and crossing the bridge had 77 students. We, the faculty also developed a virtual clinical course. This was really contained a lot of simulations that pre prepared students to attend clinical and to also start uh, gaining some of the uh, required skills needed to be excellent clinicians. During the spring and summer term, all the MSN clinical students attended this course virtually. And in fall of 2020, the MSN students did approximately 30 to 60 hours in this clinical course virtually, and then did the remainder of their uh, clinical in a face-to-face -face situation. Luckily, by July, almost all of the clinical sites were allowing our students back in to do um, their regular clinical. So this was a supplement to that, but really did work out very well. So for the DMP students, uh, the faculty developed a rigorous way of allowing them to complete their DMP projects. 
Uh, the faculty were, were careful to say, this is not DMP light. These were rigorous projects that were completed. And 47 student, DMP students did complete their Institute of Healthcare Improvement projects. And this allowed all of those students to graduate on time. So let's look at some of the um, outcomes from the virtual frontier and the virtual DMP bound. So these are the orientation sessions. Uh, and you can see when we asked the students, what was their level of connection during these sessions, during these online sessions, you can see that nearly 98% uh, reported that they felt very connected to their pro presenters and almost the same result in their connection to other students. So these virtual sessions were able to develop connections between the uh, students and faculty and the students and students and maintain that social presence that we so value. Next slide. So uh, another question, uh, what was your level of engagement during these sessions? And you can see here, it is about 97% of students said they felt very engaged during these orientation sessions. And did this, uh, this type of virtual session allow students to ask questions? And a high, high percentage reported, yes, in fact, they did. Next slide. And uh, the, the level of connection, now, now we're talking about the virtual clinical bound. Before it was the orientation, now we're on to clinical bound. So here we have similar results. Did they feel connected during the orientation? Yes, they felt connected to their presenters and they felt connected to the other students. Their level of engagement, 96% said they felt at least quite a bit engaged and most said a great deal engaged. The overall satisfaction with the clinical bound, this is an interesting slide because this shows you a comparison of the effectiveness of, front, of clinical bound year to year. So the blue is 2018, all the clinical bounds were done on site. The red is 2019. The yellow is the sessions that were done the first term in 2020 on campus. And the green is the rest of them. And you can see that in, mo in many cases, they felt even more satisfaction with the clinical bound in a virtual method than they did in going on site. Now, some of that I'm sure is related to the improvements we made in clinical bound with our um, very high level simulations, which the students enjoy so much. But it's, it is still pretty amazing that you have 98% um, saying that they were very satisfied with the clinical bound virtual sessions. Next slide. So this slide is looking at how did this did the students feel prepared to begin their clinical practicum? And you can see again, we're comparing uh, year to year. And in fact, the uh, virtual sessions were at least as, um, as effective as the on-site sessions. Next slide. So the other thing that's really important is it was important to see that the students were satisfied with these virtual sessions, but what about the preceptors? How did the preceptors feel about students that went through these virtual sessions um, and prior to attending preceptor sites? Next slide. So you can see, choose the appropriate statement below about the student's preparation compared to previous frontier students that you have precepted. So 19% said that the student was more prepared than previous frontier students. 3% said they were less prepared. And 37% said there was no difference in the students who attend virtual uh, clinical bound when compared to students who attended the on-site clinical bound. The 41% are, are preceptors who never precepted a, a frontier student before, so they really couldn't make, they have an opinion there. And this is uh, compares, the preceptor comparison, comparing our students to students from other um, settings. And you can see that 47% said our student was more prepared than students from other institutions. 7% uh, said they were less prepared and 35% said there was no difference in the preparation of this student and other institutions students preparation. And then of course you have the 10% that said this was my first time precepting. 
So overall, very good reviews from the preceptors. This is the last slide in this category. Um, did the student's preparation for clinical meet your expectations as a preceptor? And 16% said they far exceeded expectations, 40% said they exceeded expectations, and 37% said they met, met um, expectations. So overwhelmingly a very positive response from our preceptors in um, evaluating how our students were prepared for clinical. Okay, let's move on now. As we were still getting a handle on our new ways of teaching and learning and working during a pandemic, we also joined the nation in confronting social injustice and discrimination. While we issued statements pledging our support to victims and their families, to social justice and equity, and to peaceful demonstration, we also knew that these situations demanded more than words, they demanded action. In order to be an outward leader for change, were we truly embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion in all facets of our university? Where were we failing? We had to take a deep dive into our history, our present, and our future. We formed a task force charged with exploring the history and legacy of our founder, Mary Breckenridge, to uncover and understand the nuances of her beliefs and how these might have affected the formation and development of FNU. Credit for this effort must first be given to the group of students who brought the request for acknowledgement forward to our administration in 2018. Next, we must credit the group of students, faculty, staff, and external members who stepped forward and answered the call to serve on the task force. We are forever grateful for your passion, your commitment, and your time in this effort. The findings of the Mary Breckenridge Task Force were troubling and disturbing. The MBTF found evidence that Mary Breckenridge did hold racist beliefs. She believed in white superiority. She wrote widely about eugenics. And she also wrote about the value of segregation, encouraging brotherhood rather than equality. We acknowledge Mary Breckenridge's contributions as the founder of FNU and as a pioneer in public health nursing and nurse midwifery. At the same time, we denounce her discriminatory beliefs and actions. We must continually strive to understand how the past impacts us today. The most important thing that we can do is to move forward with a solid action plan that will lead us towards our goal of becoming an anti-racist university. We will learn from our past and we will allow it to lead us into a better and more just future. We did adopt this statement. Um, in response to our investigation. Frontier Nursing University rejects racism, bigotry, and hate in all forms. We acknowledge the racist and eugenics beliefs that were intertwined in the university's beginnings. Frontier Nursing University sincerely apologizes to Black, Indigenous, and people of color for a history that has failed to honor the inherent right of all individuals to equitable treatment and opportunity. The university draws upon its rich legacy of pioneering and innovation to rise to the call for reform. As hurtful as many elements of our history are, there's much to be proud of in our recent past. Just this past year, our board of directors established a board diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. They are committed to this work. Our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office successfully held the 10th Annual Diversity Impact Conference as a virtual event and also launched the Office of DEI e-newsletter. FNU was honored as a recipient of the prestigious Insight into Diversity in Higher Education Excellence in Diversity Award for the third consecutive year. We're very proud of that. This award recognizes colleges and universities that demonstrate an outstanding commitment to diversity and inclusion. We have also formed a new president's task force for DEI, whose charge is to develop an action plan to address the work that is needed to keep us moving forward towards our goal of becoming an anti-racist university. While data doesn't always tell the story, we continue to track our numbers to help gauge our progress in increasing diversity and inclusiveness across all facets of Frontier. 
In order to be an anti-racist institution and a model for others to follow, we must know our past, present, and have clearly defined goals for our future. The following slides demonstrate our progress over the past five years and reveal the distance that we still have to go. So here you can see five years of the results of our constant effort to diversify our student body. And during 2020, 26% of our students identified as a person of color. This slide shows the different types of diversity that we see in our student body, with 0.7% identifying as American Indian or Alaska Native, 2% as Asian, 11.9% as Black or African American, 7.3% Hispanic, 3.5% report multiracial, 0.2% Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, 3% selected non-disclosed, and 71.5% identified as white. We still have a lot of work to do, but we are making progress in diversifying our student body and ultimately the healthcare workforce. This is looking at our employee data. Um, so this is actually as of April of 2021, we have 244 employees, 193 of those uh, identify as white and 28 as people of color. Um, so, and then we do have 23 student, um, members of our um, employment team who uh, chose not to disclose. When you look at that by uh, staff and faculty, First, you see staff, we have 88 staff members, 76 identify as white and 9% identify as a person of color. And of the faculty, the 156 faculty, 117 identify as white and 19 identify as a person of color. Still, you can see that even though we're making large strides with our student body, we still have much more work to do with our faculty and staff diversity effort and we would really like to see that those numbers hit 20%, and we will be working on that in, the, in this year and the coming years. This slide shows the diversity of employees. Once again, you can see in blue, those that identify as white, uh, in red, those that identify as a person of color, and in yellow, those that decline to identify. In terms of leadership, we can see our board of directors uh, are reporting 18% diversity. In terms of our supervisors, 16% diversity. And on the present cabinet, 16% uh, uh, um, uh, report as a personal color. Now, that's a little bit misleading as we have one person out of six and we do strive uh, to see higher percentages in all of these areas as we move forward. These numbers tell a story of hope and opportunity and commitment to change. They also point to the fact that our actions are producing results, not always as click, quickly as we would like, but the results are evident. The reason that our emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion is so important to FNU is that in addition to it just to being the right way for all of us to treat each other, it is also incredibly important in relation to effective healthcare. The pandemic illustrated what we already knew, that rural and diverse populations are much more vulnerable and have less access to care. The pandemic impacted populations of color at a dis disproportionate rate. Maternal mortality impacts women of color as a dis at a disproportionate rate. And the numbers tell the story of inequality, but also of hope. We know that culturally competent care increases the rate of positive healthcare outcomes. How do we create culturally competent care? By recruiting, educating, and preparing a diverse healthcare workforce. We've seen how the pandemic has impacted so many businesses and industries in the past year. Naturally, there were concerns about how it would impact our student body. There have been students who have faced hardships many of whom we've been able to help via the Student Emergency Fund. 
Our enrollment and retention numbers demonstrate that our student body has remained strong and that the pandemic has thankfully had minimal impact uh, in those areas. So you can see this is our total enrollment by specialty track. Um, right now, uh, as you can see, the nurse midwifery is the largest number of students that we have. You can see how our FMP program has remained fairly stable um, with six, over 650 students. The psych mental health program has continued to grow and the women's health program, again, fairly stable. This is the yield of MSN graduates. So one of our goals is that our MSN students will move on into the companion DMP and complete a DMP degree. And this just shows, uh, this is a slow process. It's a bit challenging. And what we're finding so far is that the students do need time to go out, get certification, get themselves uh, in practice in their new profession and, um, and take a little bit of time to do that before they start the DMP. So right now we have of the family, um, about 27% started the DMP. Of the midwifery, about 23% started the DMP. Of the psych, about 18%. And of the women's health, about 20% has started the DMP. So here, this is an in, important slide because it shows the total applicants, the total accepted, and the total new enrollment. In the early part of the slide, you see first the family nurse practitioners, then nurse midwifery, women's health care, DMP, psych, MSN, and women's health completion for the midwifery students. But look at the grand total for a minute. In 2020, we had 2,075 applicants to our programs. We accepted 1,468 of them. And of those, 1,224 actually started our programs. So a very good enrollment rate during a very chaotic year. And this is degrees awarded. And again, if you look at the last bars in 2020, we awarded 197 DMP degrees, 228 MSNs with a family nurse practitioner focus, 246 nurse midwifery, 113 psych mental health, and uh, the women's health completion about 19 and the women's health care nurse practitioner about 38. So very good um, graduation rates, even during this very uh, chaotic year. This is a looks at overall retention. And so it goes back to 2019. And you can see that our retention rate is good and actually is improving. Um, the, lat, the first is FMP, then nurse midwifery, where you can see in 2019, for example, we had about a 90% overall um, retention rate. The women's health care was even higher than that at 95% and the psych mental health at about uh, 91%. For the DMP, you can see that, uh, that for the postmaster's DMP, the retention rates are climbing. For the companion DMP, we continue to work with those students. As I said before, the challenges are of um, coming out of the MSM program, getting licensed and starting a new profession while at the same time starting a DMP has been a struggle for them. So that is a area where we continue to work um, with those students. Next slide. So these are just some interesting slides that show where our students are. This is all students in all programs, and you can see that we have a good number of students in almost all states. Actually, we do have students in all states, but um, some have a lot more than others. You can see our big, very big states are um, Kentucky, North Carolina, Florida, California is a big one, Texas. Just interesting to look and see where our students are. This slide shows where we have nurse midwifery students. And again, right now we have nurse midwifery students in all of our states. Um, and this is a very important and active program for us. Same with the nurse practitioner students, very important. 
um, you can see that we have students in 48 states in all of our nurse practitioner programs right now. And this is where our faculty live. So uh, I think it is last time I looked about 43 of our states have um, faculty in them. So our faculty are also spread out across the country. And here we show preceptor sites. This is the number of preceptor sites in each state that we have uh, agreements with. So right now, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about our strategic planning process. We started our process of developing three-year goals in 2019. We published those goals in 2020 and got to work on them. So these are those goals. Goal one was to con continue to develop, evaluate, and improve our programs and our services to further our mission. And specifically, we were looking at integration of simulation across the curriculum and especially focusing on some telehealth learning and some assessment and application. We wanted to get better at inter interactive teaching and learning in an online situation for our students. We also want to develop a more comprehensive CEU program for our alumni, faculty, and other students. And to a, we will be prepping for our reaccreditation of our DMP program, which is scheduled in the winter of 2022. Goal two is to create an environment that promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion and promotes the success of all of our community members. So again, as I mentioned, we are working on increasing the diversity of our community, and we are working on diverse, uh, uh, incorporating DEI as core values throughout our community. Our, our curriculum needs some work um, in assuring that in all aspects it is reflecting a commitment to DEI. And we also wanted to implement strategies to make sure that we retain at least 85% of our enrolled students and to increase faculty and staff satisfaction and retention with a focus on our underrepresented groups. And the third goal is to build strategic relationships and partnerships with clinical sites and preceptors focusing on rural areas. Uh, our preceptors are our most important partners Without them, we cannot do the job that we set out to do. So we are looking at data-driven incentives to increase the number of alumni who become preceptors, to make sure that we create a positive environment for our preceptors and investigate opportunities to partner with health systems to expand uh, FNU's clinical site network and uh, evaluate, expand, and further develop the clinical site support system. Uh, we also want to provide targeted outreach to rural health site systems and prospective preceptors. Goal four is to continuously improve and maintain our facilities to meet the needs of students, faculty, and staff. This is a very big one for us. And during 2020, we were uh, spent the entire year finishing up the um, construction and renovation of our new campus. And we are just about there now, uh, it is just about complete. Um, we have, are implementing our campus operations, the maintenance, the security uh, systems, the food service, housekeeping, the gift shop, um, and activities management. A lot going on getting ready for next fall's opening of our new campus. Uh, we implemented uh, facility support for program management on the Versailles campus. So this is logistical support, housing assignments. So these are key cards to get in the various places, security, transportation from airport to the campus, appropriate room assignments, dietary restrictions, equipping of rooms, room access, and dormitory room assignments. So putting all those systems in place has been very important activities um, during uh, 2020 and 2021. And we are creating a facilities master plan for the, for the Versailles campus, which includes future development, capacity planning, security, and maintenance. So as we get on the campus and get in place, we'll see what it is that we still need, and what is it that we have, and what our future plans are. And um, use technology to ensure improvement and attain uh, service excellence to our community. So right now we are in the process of choosing a new student management system. This is a very big investment of time, effort, and money. And we hope that it will really pay off in better support to 
uh, students, faculty, and staff as they work within our university. We are also assessing technology needs for the new clinical lab settings on our new campus. Uh, so this is the simulation uh, settings. Um, and we're developing an implementation plan and support plan for the SimIQ, which is the background software that, that will support the telehealth uh, simulation initiatives. Um, and then expand the awareness and usage of our current software products across the FNU community. So just assuring that what we have in place is accessible and usable by all members of our community as appropriate. And in uh, our goal six is to ensure the financial strength and grow growth is sufficient to meet the needs of our university. So review all procedures and systems for fundraising to ensure compliance. So basically this is assuring that we have the financial uh, resources that we need to operate, uh, to give scholarships. Uh, we also are hoping to restart the courier program on the Versailles campus and just generally increase FNU, the profile of us as a leader in the advanced practice nursing education and midwifery area. We also wanna make sure that we uh, uh, can increase the public knowledge and understanding of the definition and scope of practice of a CNM and a CM. These are often misunderstood by the public. And so we actually have a campaign um, to help the public to understand the scope of this type of practitioner. Uh, last is to evaluate the feasibility of any new rev revenue streams that can support our mission and uh, looking at a periodic vendor review process to ensure efficient operating um, operations period. So as you can see, we intend to accomplish a great deal this year. It has never been more important that we are successful. We're not only in the midst of a pandemic and political and social unrest, but we are also in the middle of a significant period of time of the history of Frontier. Our new campus is ready and waiting for us. We can't wait to share it with our students and the entire FNU community. It's going to be worth the wait. As we've done for the past year, we will continue to monitor the pandemic, conducting the majority of our work virtually until it is safe for people to travel to campus. We have tentative plans for a clinical bond on campus in August. And if all goes well, we hope that we will lead on-campus activities and a grand opening in September. Of course, we will always put the safety of our students, faculty, and staff first, and we will delay these uh, on-campus activities if the circumstances uh, dictate. So thank you very much to each and every one of you uh, for helping us to get through this very difficult year. We persisted through the cha challenges with the frontier culture shining through, teamwork, dedication, innovation, and hard work. Thank you very much.